I'm uh, Corey Wilkes, uh, KN4ULL. I uh, actually got my general last year, uh, the, the tech and the general at the same time. So I'm uh, still pretty new to ham, but uh, I have a lot of experience in engineering. So from the engineering side, I, I have a, a lot going on there. Um, so I was going to talk about some, uh, some tower stuff with you guys. <coughs> So my background, uh, I'm a structural engineer. Uh, I work for Jacobs. Uh, I've got four and a half years in telecommunications towers. Um, I'm also a certified competent climber and rescue climber. Uh, so I do uh, tower climbing. Uh, and at the end, I was gonna go over some, some basic safety gear and, and things to keep in mind. Um, but uh, so these are kind of, Typical of what I uh, work on, I uh, do a lot of the math on the towers themselves. Um, we engineers <laughs> think those are just as ugly as everybody else, so uh, those things, they're an eyesore. Um, I, I don't know who thinks that they're hiding when they stand 100 feet taller than the other tree in the area, <laughs> but uh, somebody had that bright idea, so I have actually seen some good ones, but most of them are pretty bad. <clears throat> I think one of them was a flag pole. We do, there, there are a lot of flag poles, um, a lot of uh, church steeples and church signs, a lot of times we'll have them. Um, uh, basically, in telecommunications, anywhere we can hide an antenna, we try to, um, especially if we can utilize an existing structure. Um, but then, of course, that comes back on us of can that existing structure handle the additional wind loading uh, and the weight of the antenna systems. So what I was going to go over was just uh, basic uh, tower designs, give you guys an idea. Uh, tower load path, so that's really how the tower transfers the wind load to the ground. Um, because when you're dealing with towers, your number one issue is going to be your wind load. Uh, so I was going to go over kind of a real simplified uh, wind loading. Um, an example of it and then some uh, in-depth for anybody who really likes math uh, and who feels really nerdy. I'm just going to touch on that for you guys. But uh, I'm going to leave before that. Book. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so when it comes to uh, towers, typically we consider three types of towers. Um, so this one in, in the telecommunications in industry, we call this a monopole. Uh, in hand, usually we call it a mast. Um, sometimes these can be telescoping, sometimes they're uh, fixed. Uh, then we've got guide towers, usually some sort of uh, truss uh, system going up and with guy wires. And the design of these guy wires are essential for them. Um, you can sometimes get away with doing a guide tower if it's real short without guys, but once you hit a certain height, I mean, they're really designed to be held with guys. Uh, and then your self-support, uh, don't, again, with our short towers, some of you guys are, are gonna do fine with just doing a self-support, but uh, when you get into bigger towers, it comes with bigger headaches. <coughs> so, the, uh, <laughs> so kind of the, the differences, the benefits of your, your mask and your monopoles, it's real cheap to get a pipe. Uh, they're very simple. Uh, again, some of them can be telescoping, um, and the downside is that when you're just working with a single pipe, your capacity is not going to be a whole lot. Um, so when you're really looking at increasing capacity and what can your tower handle, you know, your monopole is going to be at the, the very bottom of that. Um, your guide towers, they're going to be really lightweight um, because they're, uh, instead of using uh, uh, thickness of material, to give you that strength, they're using those guy wires to give you a lot of additional capacity. Um, they're pretty simple. Um, you've got a single uh, tower and guy wires coming off. Uh, are you going to mention anything about the tension on those guy wires? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> they're very sturdy. Uh, the one of the benefits of the guy towers is those wires um, all but eliminate any movement of the tower. Um, it's, it's very difficult for the tower to move around because those guy wires are holding it stationary. So they're very sturdy. Uh, downside, space requirements. Uh, when you're running guy wires, 
you, you got to see how far out can you get them. Uh, the further the angle, the further out you can get them, the better you're going to do, the smaller wire you can run. Um, so it really, what is your space limitations? Um, <clears throat> with guy towers, another issue is buckling considerations. Mm -hmm. I'll go into that in a bit, but uh, when you're putting an additional load on top, you know, it, it's trying to make your tower buckle out. Um, <clears throat> Self-support, they're very sturdy. Uh, they're solid. Uh, they are expensive though, when you start getting into the bigger ones. Um, also, when you're looking at multi-leg self-support towers, you're talking about multiple foundations. Uh, so it can get uh, quite pricey. <laughs> as far as what uh, most uh, of, of everyone here, I'm assuming, is doing, um, you're not going to get too high with your self-support. So you shouldn't have to worry about multiple foundations for the most part. Um, really, that's for when you're getting 150 feet and up. <clears throat> so, uh, I'm a, a visual learner, so I, I brought some, some visual aids to help snag a handful of uh, straws. <clears throat> so when we're dealing with a mast or a monopole, it is fixed at the bottom, and then your antenna loading is going to be at the top. So when you're loading, <clears throat> you're going to cause deflections in your mast. Right, your, your bottom's not gonna move, but your top's gonna bend, right? And as that wind loading moves around, so is your, your mast, right? So that means your antenna's moving around also. Um, that can be good or bad. Um, typically, you, you want it to be fairly stiff so that it doesn't move, but um, that's one of the downsides with uh, mast-type poles is that you are going to have movement. There, there's almost no way to eliminate the movement at the top of the pole. <clears throat> um, and when it comes to the actual loading, what it's doing is it, it's creating a what we call a beam uh, type of setup here. So the side towards the wind is actually going to be stretched. Uh, it'll be in tension, and the side away from the wind will be compressed and squished together. Um, so a lot of times it's hard to kind of see that when you're talking about a real thin mast. You know, it's real hard to see the what's going on on the inside, but uh, just remember that towards the wind, it, it's trying to pull that apart because your pole is having to fight that motion of the wind, the wind pushing on it. <clears throat> now, when it comes to guys, one of the things is you you won't have any movement at the top typically uh, because you're guying, right? That the cable is going to handle all that horizontal load. But in order to do that, this guy wire here is going to be in tension, right? It's going to be pulling on that guy. But to compensate, we have to put additional loading in the pole. Uh, and so when you're dealing with guide poles, you're dealing with an additional vertical loading on the pole. Uh, and when you start loading it and it gets too much, it'll buckle. So that's one of the things with to consider with guys is you know, what's my vertical capacity here? Uh, because the last thing you want is to uh, buckle out the middle. Um, now, one of the things with guy towers is, and I'll get into a little bit more, is additional guys to brace against that buckling. Um, because again, with buckling, that's a movement. So if you can stop that move, movement with additional guy wires, you won't have a buckling issue there. <clears throat> so to talk about guy wires, <clears throat> when it comes to guy wires, uh, they're a function of the angle and the load. Now with what we're doing, we can't control the wind load, right? So all we can control is the angle. And as I said, the further out you can run that, the bigger the angle between the tower and the guy, the lower the overall downward load on your pole. So, <clears throat> actually through the, uh, the formula here, so your load multiplied cosine over sine. <clears throat> oh, sorry. Okay, yeah, so this is your added vertical load. <laughs> your tension here is your load uh, over your side angle when you're considering your angle from your pole. <clears throat> 
So the, the further out you can pull that uh, loading angle, the lower the tension and the lower the vertical load will be. <clears throat> uh, but again, that comes back to your space considerations. What does your property look like? You know, where can you anchor to? Um, whether or not you're going to be putting in additional foundations for your guy wires to anchor into, or if you can find something to tie to. Uh, if you had a, let's say you had a, you were wanting to put in guys, and let's say it was about a 60 to 80 foot tower. Okay. And uh, your guy wires in this case, uh, I've seen aircraft grade stainless steel, uh, eight inch wire, uh, eight inch cable. Okay. And then I've also seen the, the uh, cheaper grade quarter inch cable, kind you buy, let's say, at uh, Harbor Freight. Yeah. And uh, it's it looks like it's galvanized. Most of them are, are galvanized. Yeah. yeah. Um, so. In the telecommunications industry, we actually run uh, almost always uh, galvanized aircraft cable is what it's called. Uh, a lot of times you'll hear it referred to as wire rope. Um, it is galvanized. Uh, it's not stainless. Uh, you can run stainless. It's going to get more expensive is one of the big issues with stainless. Uh, so that's why the industry primarily is using galvanized. With galvanized, you'll want to check and do an inspection every so often. Um, but it'll take quite a few years before any rust starts to get through the, the galvanized coating. <laughs> um, and they're all, uh, all those galvanized cables should meet the minimum standards. There's a standards, a whole set of standards set for the galvanized cables. Uh, in telecommunications, we use the EHS, the extra high strength. Um, that's not required for ham. Uh, really what you're gonna wanna look at is what sort of tension you're gonna be putting on it um, and then make your assessment based on that. Corey? Yes. Uh, is it true that, that the, the ideal angle is 45 degrees minimum or, and further up because then your vertical and horizontal component so, is the same? <laughs> Ideal, it would be 90 degrees, but that's not possible. Um, so, yeah, yeah, exactly. That would be ideal. Um, it really depends on your situation. Um, most times in telecommunications, we're running uh, between 20 and 30 degrees a lot of times. So we're actually running fairly steep. Yeah. up to the top of the tower. Now the lower yeah, points, real if, we're, if we're dropping it lower, right, then our, our angle is going to be less. less. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so if we're anchoring at multiple points, and that's why on those big guy towers, um, there's one, it's uh, just east of Atlanta as you're driving down 20, there's a pair of guy towers side by side. Mm -hmm. uh, if, I don't even know how many guy wires on there. Um, but if you'll notice, they're running guy wires every probably 50 feet or so um, on that one it's a lot of guy wires and the, the idea is to shorten those sections so that they can get by with a with a smaller section now when they run multiple guys do they, do, uh, they normally run out here to single concrete or do they run multiple concrete towers? typically uh one of two situations typically they'll run them all to the same yeah. location or they'll run say your your upper third upper half guys to one anchor mm -hmm. and then your lower third lower half to a, a closer in anchor um, <clears throat> but always in the the same direction yeah. um, mm -hmm. because you want your guys to be able to handle a load from any direction, and you don't want any odd uh, load paths going to your tower. So typically with your guys, you're going to want run one straight out from each leg of your tower. Or if you're using a mast, you would run one at 120 degrees from each other, uh, is the ideal. Now that's why the tension on the, would be the cosine, uh, that's the sine angle for the guy tension. Yeah. So, um, Corey, 
I'll need to double check those formulas to make sure. <laughs> uh, you, you, you may be getting into this a little later, but how, how important is the load characteristics of the tower surface area itself? So I actually get into that in, in just a bit. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> um, another thing that was brought up to me is how do braces affect your tower? Right, so if you've got a 40 foot tower and you put a brace to your barn 12 feet up the tower, how does that affect it? Uh, and so what we're looking at there is, is what uh, we're looking at is our unbraced length, okay? The easiest way to think, that's why I brought a bunch of straws here, is uh, when you compare two different sizes uh, of a member, that one half. Is this going to be a monopole type of situation? <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> but it, it's, it's universal, the idea. Um, so the idea being that if I load these two links the same, mm -hmm. the long one is going to buckle <laughs> way before the short one does. Right? Because the longer the length, the more susceptible to buckling. Um, <clears throat> And so that's what this uh, K factor we use in engineering is for, right? This is assessing, you know, what uh, what is our buckling chances with that, right? What, how does the in conditions affect buckling? Um, and so you'll notice here when we fix the top and fix the bottom, we have the lowest K value, right? So that gives us the most potential. Obviously, with a ham tower, we can't fix the top, right? We, we can't mount it to a crane or anything because that defeats the whole purpose. So what we're going to look at is we're going to look at here is our standard mast, right? It's fixed at the bottom, but free to float around at the top. So that's a, a two value, K value, right? So the, in engineering, this is our ideal pinned at both ends. Um, so in relation to our ideal condition, it's uh, going to buckle at half the load, is what that means. So it's one over your K value. I get it. Not in, uh, anyway, one over your K value is, is your load, your unbraced length comparison. So we want to reduce this as much as possible. Now, the other option here is when we have a, where is it? Uh, yeah, it's this one here. <clears throat> Our guide tower is fixed at the bottom and pinned at the top. So pinned meaning it can't move. It can still rotate, but there's not really much rotation at that point up there, uh, but it can't move uh, laterally. So <clears throat> when we go from a monopole or a mast and we're bringing it down to a guide tower, it makes a huge difference in our buckling capacity. Um, basically, it is over double the, the capacity when we do that. Now, the thing, like I said before, you gotta take into mind is adding those guy wires also adds additional load, right? So does that additional load you're putting on your, your mast outweigh the bracing you get from the cable. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> that's Typical something you can tension on a guy wire for like a ham thing. What would you just generally put that at? So in the, in telecommunications, we run ten percent. So whatever our breaking strength is, we tension it up to ten percent of that. So that leaves us ninety percent of the capacity to handle the movement. Can you be more? I'm, I'm not clear on that. What do you mean? So, um, for instance, our. You talking about the, the wind loading it, 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 as in, in pounds? For the guy tension? Yeah. No, the uh, so um, I want to say it's. Uh, <laughs> so this is the static. Tension yeah. That the, you, it, it's the that static tension when you first erect the, the tower. Oh. You, you put the ten, you tension up the guys, um, and so I think a three eighths is like a twenty nine thousand pound capacity, and so we would run two point nine thousand pound 
tension on it. Oh, I got you. Now I got you. Um, so it's related to the cable you're using. Correct. Okay. Yeah, we, we're putting some tension on them. We don't want them to move. Now, it's a gradual thing because obviously you have to tension one at a time. But yeah, when you're tensioning up those cables, they, they get uh, pretty snug. If you go out there and look at them, you'll see that they're pretty much a straight line up. Yeah. Almost no sag in those guys. Uh, and that's really what you're looking for. Um, an easy way to kind of guesstimate the tension is to look at the amount of sag in your line. So you want to get it up tight so there's very little sag. Because any sag in your cable means potential movement in the top of your tower. Right? And as soon as you start getting movement in the top of your tower, you start pushing away from your 0.7 back towards your 2. I'm not going to it sings to you. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> yes. I gather by this that you don't recommend at all using some of the non-conductive Datron. I'm not familiar with that. Yeah. yeah, that's that's pretty typical. That's I, I use it in quarter inch. Okay. It's, it's basically a, and it it has some stretch capability, but it's good for six seven hundred pounds. And yeah. and for for for. For example, for what I'm doing, that's more than adequate at the new loads and the wind that I'm seeing. So I when would not with a say a 60 to 90 foot tower. Yeah. One of the problems with the uh, aircraft type cable, that's unless you can put insulators in there, you're going to have uh, conductive problems with your radiation. Yeah, yeah it's going to be. So non insulated or insulated. Guys, this is perfectly fine. What you want to look at is your capacity on it. Uh, how much capacity? So I would not use your uh, 550 aircraft bungee cord, you know, that the military loves. Um, I would not use that 550 cord. Uh, it just, there's not enough capacity in it. Uh, one big gust on there and it's gonna snap those lines easy. Uh, so you really want to look at what is your capacity? <laughs> um, and then I'll go back to the formulas. But so you, you can look up the right and strength. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so the rule of thumb. Is, I want to get the rule of thumb. So, if you know what your ring load is, and you know what the vertical and horizontal component is. Yes. Uh, and can you then? What kind of margin should you have for a given set of circumstances? For example, in my case, I'm going to use 30 miles an hour as my drop dead point with with a, a certain wind loading, and that that will equate to how much tension is going to be on a guy. Yes. So. so yeah. The way I would run it, personally, is I would look at what my worst case potential ever would be, right? Um, and we'll get into in the loading here in a minute. Uh, but look at that. Look at, <coughs> run the calculation for how much it is, for what your tension on it is going to be. Uh, and then once you know what your tension is going to be, you want to keep a good factor of safety. So at minimum, I would double it with your breaking strength. Um, because it's it's one of those that if your guy fails in a high wind issue, the whole tower's coming over. Um, and I've seen, especially on those big towers, the progressive failure is what we call them, um, where one snaps at the top, which loads the next one down too much and it snaps, and then the next one snaps, and uh, we've actually got a picture in our office of one that one of our construction guys saw in a, it, I don't know how it stopped, but it paused mid construct, mid uh, collapse. Um, and it was just hanging. Uh, the top three guys are all snapped. And so it was a, a guy tower that was just bent over hanging. Wow. And you got a picture of it. Um, he went back by two days later and it was on the ground. Yeah. Um, so they are not designed to stand without those guys. So I would think using that rope, the, the, the Dacron. Dacron could be real risky on a high tower. 
Oh, the reason why I say that, if you uh, if you went up that tower or climbed that tower. Oh, no, 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 no. This stuff's only good for 600 pounds. Okay. You know, I mean, you, it, 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 how are you going to work on your tower? Well, you gotta, you gotta I, have a, I crank mine down. Mine's a cranker. So, yeah, oh yeah, I don't climb okay. Now, one of the things when it comes to guy towers, um, when you're actually climbing it, you're not adding additional loading to the guy wires. The guy wires are, are there to take wind loading. All right, so uh, putting a man on the tower doesn't really affect the guys on the guy tower. No, it's a, it's um, a ver total vertical. Yeah, it's, it's purely a vertical load. Um, the guys are handling your horizontal loads. <coughs> So, uh, but anyway, back to, to braces real quick. So your brace, what it does is it shortens the overall length um, of your tower. So the shorter the length, like I said with the straws, the more capacity it has. So when you brace your, your tower at a certain height, it's like adding a, another fixed point. So really the, only the top part of your tower is doing any movement. Um, so braces are very beneficial, and hey, <laughs> all right. So when it comes to loading, um, we use uh, the American Society of Civil Engineers uh, has a very thorough uh, wind loading calculation. Um, it takes into uh, into consideration everything out there. Uh, and uh, that was adopted by TIA, the Telecommunications Industry Association, I believe, uh, in their most recent code. Uh, and that's what we work with primarily is the, the telecommunications code. Uh, but it's based off of the American Society of Civil Engineers code. Uh, and they have numbers from everywhere in the country. Uh, here's an example. So this is a, I believe that's a, uh, risk category two wind map. Uh, so you can see down here at the tip of Florida, you're looking at 180 miles an hour. Now, understand this is your design loading, okay? So this is worst case scenario. Uh, and if you notice, we're back right around there. Uh, we're in the, is it 110 line there? So we're between 110 and there's a 105 line right there. <clears throat> um, but when it comes to actually figuring out what your wind loading is going to be, what you know, what your antenna is going to be, um, the things you need is your wind speed, uh, which thankfully uh, ATC, I forget there. The name of the group that does it but they have a website that if you put in an address or latitude and longitude it will give you the design wind speed <laughs> um, so you'll need the wind speed you'll need the shape factor uh, which is basically w what shape your members are uh, really there's three categories primarily it's round flat and square or rectangle is the last category um, and then your antenna wind area. <clears throat> so those are the three things you'll need to run a, a real basic. <clears throat> when, you, when you say shape factor, you're talking about the tower structure itself? Uh, the, the tower structure and the antenna structure, both. They, uh, so if your tower is a square pipe uh, and your antenna is made of round uh, radials, uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, what yeah. radiators? Horizontal elements. Mean, like it's uh, like it, yes, all, all elements that the wind will will hit. Basically, what what are the typically we're, we're talking round yeah. in hand, right? right. Uh, just about everything is, is working with round members, either wire members which are round or you tubes. know larger tubes. Yeah. Tubes. <clears throat> um, so, starting off with the wind speed. So, um, our Three second gust for a risk category two. Risk category two is, is generic. Uh, I, I recommend staying with risk category two. Uh, there is a risk category one with lower wind speeds. That's primarily designed for agricultural. So if you're connecting your tower to a barn, uh, 
or if it, your tower is just out in a field away from everything, you can get by with a risk category one. Uh, typically, if your tower can fall on your house at all, then you're going to want to keep it at risk category two. Um, Does that so. happen to uh, a ham? A very good friend of mine down in Florida, he was in Hurricane Andrew, and it better put it down right over the top of his house. Yeah. I don't know what the wind factor that they did this way or put them down would have been enough. Yeah. <laughs> and so this is <laughs> typically this is not necessarily considering hurricane winds, although I mean you guys saw on the Florida it can they're running at 180 miles an hour. Um, so it, it will take up to some hurricane level winds uh, if you're in a hurricane area. But if the hurricane's bad enough, honestly, we don't expect anything to survive. Um, that's why there's actually a risk category three and a risk category four. Uh, risk category four, that's your hospitals, your fire stations, your police stations. Um, also, we get into that sometimes with telecommunications if we're running a primary repeater for a police department on the tower. Um, so we'll have to move the tower to a, a risk category four for that tower. Uh, and it, it is a significant increase of what they can handle. Um, but most everything is a risk category two. Uh, so when you go to the website, and I've got a link later on, uh, you'll see that for here, this is uh, the Chamber of Commerce where we're at right now, risk category two, we would design for 106 mile an hour wind, which is quite a bit. Where do you get the 106 mile an hour? Uh, specifically, do you know the uh, wind speed for Carroll County? <clears throat> uh, I can look up the wind speed. It's probably going to be right in that 100, 506 range. Um, as you can see, here's our 105 line. Here's our 110 line. And we're kind of in between there. Um, Those are be close. Yeah, yeah. So this is down here. Uh, south of Columbus. Columbus. Yeah, so uh, they're very wide areas, so it, it'll be around the same. Um, at the end of the presentation, I have a link to the website okay. where you can look up your wind speed. Uh, uh, so when it comes to uh, doing the calculations, I created a, a super simplified version of the calculation. Um, and the idea is just to give you something that will give you an idea of how much loading. Again, 106 mile an hour is worst case. It's the worst expected, uh, you know, typical, I think it is the, what's, what's called the uh, 100 year uh, statistical uh, peak. Uh, basically it's, it's <clears throat> one in 100 chance of happening in any year, uh, what, what would that hit? Uh, and that's 106 miles an hour for three seconds. Well, Corey, that, and, and, and I understand all these maximum numbers, but that assumes that you're going to have a fixed tower that you have no alternative but let it sit there and endure that condition. Correct, correct. This does not take into account if you're have a telescoping tower, if you have a way of uh, turning your tower into the wind to uh, minimize the wind area. Um, so there's a lot that this doesn't take into account. This is worst case scenario. Does the calculation take into account possible tornadic activity? No. Uh, tornadoes are, are considered to be a, beyond the scope of this. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> it, it's one of those that if, you got bigger problems. Yeah. <laughs> if we were designing for tornadoes, and, and that's a, a question we get as far as a lot of structures uh, for structural engineers. Um, an example is the, uh, a great example I hear a lot is the levee in uh, New Orleans that busted. Um, it was originally designed for a category four hurricane. The city said, we can't afford that. Can you design it for a category three? I said, sure, we can design it for a category three. The chances of a direct hit of a category three were pretty small, pretty small. 
they never expected a Category 5 direct hit. Um, and so it never stood a chance. And so a lot of people were upset at the engineers. Why didn't this levee last? It was supposed to last through a hurricane. There's a big difference between a Category 3 and a Category 5. Yeah. Um, and so the same here is, is this is statistically the maximum we would hit in an area, but there's a big difference between 106 and a tornado. Uh, and so realistically, yes, we could design for a tornado if we really wanted to. It, it comes down to being cost effective. It's just not cost effective to design for the absolute worst out there on everything. Um, it, you just run out of money. Is category one, am I reading that right, is 90 mile an hour? Yeah, so this is, <clears throat> so understand, That's 99. In, in, in the, uh, in the full, 99? yeah, it's a 99 miles an hour. Uh, in the full calculation, there's a lot of factors that that take different things into consideration that'll bring that number down. Because, okay. Well, but what what I saw was Rome Powers claimed that they designed this for 90 miles an hour. Uh, yes. So there are a lot of tower manufacturers that are designing towers that don't necessarily meet these standards, right? Because they're designing them for um, non-commercial purposes, right? I, realistically, this is for commercial loading. <laughs> so this is really beyond the scope of, of what hams need, but I wanted you to see, even with this 106 mile an hour wind, what we end up with is actually a very reasonable loading. Uh, so we'll get there. but. Uh, so for Paulding County, 106 mile an hour. <laughs> uh, now this simplified version that I came up with is going to be significantly higher than if you actually do the the whole process uh, and run the calculation on it. Um, and that that's life because with simplicity, you want to be conservative. You don't want to simplify something and potentially end up in a dangerous territory. So when we, whenever we simplify things as engineers, we always push to the conservative. Um, and so this is gonna be significantly higher, but it's gonna be a lot simpler. It's you know, a quick calculation you can run. So you'll take your point zero zero two five six times the velocity squared. So, so oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. So 106 mile an hour squared multiplied by that will give you your wind pressure. So that's step one. Okay, you're, uh, let's, let's assume that you're putting up, let's say a, a 60 foot tower open territory and you buy it at two different places okay. right here. Would that be a, a reasonable, uh, what kind of wind do you think something like that would handle if it's guy? Uh, Regardless of, of the, the tower type, if it's in an open area and it can't fall on any residential or anything like that, you could run a, a risk category one, no problem. Um, and this is this is designed for structures that likely are not going to have people in them. Okay, so your risk category one is, is for all your uh, barns, um, your chicken coops, uh, anything like that. Even uh, on commercial scale uh, farming applications, if it's designed to not really have a lot of human uh, involvement, right, a very low risk chance of a person being there, then we'll run a risk category one on it. Uh, residential falls under risk category two. So Corey, how, if, if you were gonna put up a tower, a substantial tower, how much does it cost to get somebody to do an engineering analysis? Um, <sighs> kind of give you the true engineering. It, it really depends on how in depth you want to go. Um, I, I don't know what our firm charges. Um, I have done individual analysis. Um, understand I am not yet licensed. I'm actually taking the test in April uh, so that I can get the piece of paper that proves that I know how to do the calculations I'm doing. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so I'm already doing all the work, but I'm not licensed. Uh, and so it's one of those, I can tell you what the load will be, but I can't 
tell sure. you as an engineer. Right. What, right. Um, <clears throat> so uh, to actually get a licensed engineer to run it, um, I, I don't know, but I'm sure it's not going to be cheap. Um, uh, one of the things I do want to do once I do get my license is start offering some uh, budget level uh, engineering services to hams in the community because I know that there are a lot of guys out there who are like, yeah, I'd really like to just put up a 50 foot tower, but you know, spending 10 grand to get a, a structural analysis is is completely absurd. Um, and so, you know, how, how can I make sure it's safe without uh, spend it too much. Again, it goes back into that being cost effective. Uh, Troy, there, there's, there's a, uh, I was, of course, the, probably all the line in the process of going through a lot of that. And I contacted the U.S. Towers, the engineer there, uh, and he was very helpful. And I gave him the, the scenario. This is what I want to do. This is what I have and so forth. And so by and large, from what I've experienced, that kind of that kind of engineering is not really necessary. It, 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 now, correct me if I'm mistaken. Now you know my application. For for most ham uh, applications, uh, an actual structural analysis is not necessary. Um, you're not loading it with enough to make it worthwhile. Uh, now you'll see a lot of your uh, tower companies when they do put out a tower, they're rating them for, you know, it can only handle 10 square feet of antenna at 50 miles an hour. Um, they are severely derating those so that they don't have to deal with doing structural analysis. So um, derating means being conservative. Yes, being yeah. extremely conservative. Um, <clears throat> so. <clears throat> So this would give you the wind pressure. We go to the next step here. So the next part is your shape factor. Uh, these are also simplified, but it's really how does the wind react when it hits a member? Uh, when, a, when wind hits a flat member, it's much more of a wind sail. It's, it's like trying to pull a kite, right? When you hit a, a square member, it, it's still, has resistance but it's better when you've got a round member it flows much more smoothly over the round member uh, and you'll see that here um, so these are uh, your shape factors so your round is significantly lower than your square and your flat so you'll get your, your round your, your shape factor um, multiply that by your area of your wind area of your antenna um, CA is your shape factor and your um, wind pressure, what we just calculated before. So I was going to show an example here. <clears throat> so I uh, got inspiration from somebody here about uh, what we're running here. So assuming we're going to put up a tower here uh, at the Chamber of Commerce for latitude and longitude, uh, we're going to throw uh, a Cushcraft uh, HF Yagi multiband. It's got a five and a half square foot wind area. Uh, just about every man antenna manufacturer will give you a, a wind area for their antenna. Uh, per the ATC, it's 106 miles an hour. The members are all round, so it's a 1.2 shape factor. <clears throat> now this. When you said uh, the shape factor, everything was round, is that also for like a triangular tower? That's so, ever that's got round pipe? Yes. That's not receiving, so, that's not receiving the big load. It's so the, the majority of your load is going to be from the antennas, right. not from the tower. So this is actually just for your antenna load. Okay. Uh, but you can do the same thing for your tower loading if you know your, uh, your wind area <laughs> of your tower. But again, 90% of the time it's going to be round members. Mm -hmm. So you use that round, even though it is a triangular tower, mm -hmm. the individual members are round. And so the, the wind is going to be treating those members as round. But of course, in light of that, the, the, the loading on your tower as it as it goes closer to the hinge point, uh, in, in, in other words, it, it's a uh, 
it's a calculus problem, isn't it? Yes. So so it becomes almost We're simplifying for this, yeah. but yes, your your loading changes so at the top as far as just your tower loading. Your tower loading is going to be more and it's going to slope down until at the base of your tower, you're basically not going to have any wind load. Um, because the closer to ground, the more resistance the air gets. Um, and so at that point, next to ground, there's, there's next to no wind load. Uh, I'm sure you guys, when you've looked at your antennas in high winds, you can be standing on the ground and there's not that much movement, but if you look up in the antenna or look in the trees, you'll see things moving around up at an elevation. Uh, this does not take any of that into account because I wanted something simplified. Uh, and so here, our wind loading is 28.8 pounds per square foot. Uh, if we take that plus our shape factor and our wind area, we're looking at about 190 pounds on a five and a half square foot antenna. So the, the 28.8 pounds per square foot is based on 106 miles an hour? Based on 106 mile an hour wind, yes. Oh man, see I would have well, that's hardly any. It, it surprises people how, Lo how low little is. loading it's actually getting even on, under extreme conditions. That's why I said even running at 106 miles an hour, uh, so most 28 antennas, pounds per square foot is, is not a lot of wind pressure. Most, now, if, if it's on you, you're going to feel it because you have a pretty significant wind area. But on the antenna, the antenna is not getting as that much loaded. Now, one of the issues, though, is when you've got that 28.8 on very slender members, you may see the members bending, or even sometimes they'll buckle. Um, but as far as your load on your tower, right, we're only talking about a 190 pound load horizontal load, Jeez. right? So, it, even under extreme conditions, it's it's not a lot. <clears throat> And then if that's if that's a, if that's guided at a 25 degree angle, then you really only have half that half of it's horizontal and half of it's um, 70 percent. Yeah, seven, uh, roughly 70 percent. Oh, 70 uh, percent. 70 percent additional loading <laughs> uh, in your tower vertically. Yeah. Trigonometry problem. Yep. Sign it. Sign. Sign. So that's what I wanted you guys to see is that even with um, the extreme 106 mile an hour wind, it actually, in the end, because we're dealing with round members uh, and we're dealing with not huge wind areas, it's actually not that bad of a load. Uh, so when somebody, your tower manufacturer says, hey, this is only designed for 10 square feet at 50 miles an hour, that's a severely derated tower, typically. Um, oh, now, as far as realistically that's what it can handle, that's, that's really good. CYA. <laughs> the attorney, the attorney load. As, as far as what it realistically can handle, I, I do want to <laughs> caution, don't go overboard. Um, because one of the things at that point, once you start going overboard beyond what they say, at that point, if anything does happen to the tower, they're going to look at you and say, hey, you didn't follow our rules. We're not liable. Good luck. You're on your own. Yeah. Well, your calculations don't show anything about twist moment. Ah, I can't remember the last time I saw a ham tower with torsion boards on it. So, so yeah. typically mm -hmm. with the, the ham towers, they're not mm -hmm. tall enough to, uh, the, twist. to they're, we're really worried about twist. Um, your, your torsion is going to come from uneven loading uh, on your tower. Now, where, where I've seen that is that it's a massive beam and you immediately hit the brake before they put delays on brakes <laughs> and saw a tower twist down. A lot of periodic has got a pretty heavy load yeah. to it whenever you <laughs> hit the brake. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, are we going to talk about that? I'm very interested. Yeah, I, I was going to in, in at the end. I was gonna, yeah. uh, so these are the Telecommunications Industry Association. This is the code we work with. Um, they updated it in 2017. Um, it applies to all towers. Uh, typically, hand towers do not fall under it um, because they're not commercial and because they're so small, 
they're not worried about it. Um, uh, even uh, the FCC, I believe, isn't worried about your tower until it's 150 feet, I believe. 200. Is it 200? Okay. Yeah, it's FAA, it's 200. Or the FAA, sorry, FAA, yeah. Um, so, um, we work with a, a lot of short monopoles that are in the uh, 150 foot range because even the telecommunications industry is saying, hey, if we can avoid dealing with FAA, life is easier. Um, but we also deal with towers that are stretching up 400 feet in the air uh, and really reaching up there into the sky. Um, the other code, again, where the wind loading comes from is the American Society of Civil Engineers. Uh, they updated their code in 2016. The wind maps are very thorough. Uh, they've done a, a fantastic job of going throughout the U.S. and really collecting all the data, checking different areas, and seeing how it's affected. Um, uh, these apply to all buildings. Um, it applies to non-buildings uh, such as your billboards. Um, so anything non-telecommunications but still structural. Um, codes may vary by jurisdiction. Uh, here in Georgia it's easy. Uh, we're using these but uh, if you're trying to build different places it is completely determined by your jurisdiction. Uh, some places Yes. If you're in certain city limits, they're going to want to see a structural analysis if you put a foundation. But if you just rest it on top of the soil, you're good. Other jurisdictions don't care as long as it's not going to have any life support. Um, so every jurisdiction loves to make up rules. So that's a bureaucracy for you. Uh, as far as in-depth, if you really want to go in-depth, <laughs> so these are all your K factors. <laughs> Each one of them, that, will you? huh? Make your copy that. <laughs> Every one of them addresses something different. Uh, so you'll see you've got your velocity above ground. Uh, so this is where you were talking about how at ground level your velocity is basically none, but as you get up higher and higher your velocity increases. All right, so your KZ is dealing with your velocity. Your KZT is dealing with your topography, right? If you're on top of a mountain versus at the bo bottom of a mountain, if you're on the edge of a cliff, uh, the wind changes tremendously. Uh, <laughs> KS, your building speed up. Uh, typically in your downtown areas, you're gonna run into issues with building speed up. Uh, Windy City, Chicago is a great example. You, step out from beside a building into the prevailing wind and it, on, a, on a rough day it could knock you over. You um, that, uh, over in France, in Paris, for example, the Eiffel Tower, you would think that would make one hell of an antenna tower. It sways 24 feet. They won't let people up there with a certain wind because it sways 24 feet on the top of it. Yeah. I don't think they had all these calculations when they built it. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Neither, neither, did the, neither did the guy in the What I'm saying there is that's all sort of environmental issues. It's not really the, the hard engineering of, well, it's not the basic engineering. I mean, this, these are real subtle nuances that occur in your design, right? Yes. Yeah, so these are all uh, site-specific yeah, affecting the design. Yeah. Uh, and so you know, these can, can vary widely within a very small area even. Um, so for instance, your topography um, can vary significantly within a small area, um, especially someplace like Stone Mountain's a great example. Stone, the top of Stone Mountain, your, uh, your topography it's going to play a huge role in that. Um, now, other areas like uh, where, where Dave and I are, Rock Mart, there's some small hills, but the overall area is generally hilly. It's not going to play near as much of a, of a role as opposed to Stone Mountain, which is completely flat and then giant rock. <laughs> um, your ground elevation, the farther you are from sea level, does make a difference. Uh, your direction probability, uh, in previous versions, this was a big issue, they've simplified it. 
but it's basically uh, if you're in a valley and you've got prevailing winds one of two directions down that valley, it's not likely you're going to get a crosswind across the valley. Um, so what's the probability in any specific direction that you're going to exceed that wind capacity? Uh, <clears throat> Dave, if I was uh, your insurance company, I'd hire somebody like him when your tire falls. Again, your V is your wind speed, your velocity. Um, risk category two is, is pretty safe assumption. Unless it's in an area where if it falls, it's not going to land on anything residential or anything likely to have people in it. Uh, then you can drop to a risk category one for our purposes. Um, your antenna EPA, effective projected area. So basically your wind area of your antenna. Uh, and that is, it should be, uh, if you're building your own antenna, it should be the horizontal area of every member that's going to get hit by the wind. And so if you've got <coughs> multiple members stacked behind each other like a, with a Yagi, uh, each one of those you're going to have to add up. You cannot consider, okay, well, it's going to hit the first one and it's going to deflect and just ignore all the rest because it will curve around the first one and then it'll hit the second one and it'll curve around that and hit the third one and so on. Uh, and so your, your projected area is the entire wind area of that antenna. Uh, and typically that's your worst case scenario. Uh, so like with a Yagi, you're going to get more wind area running down the boom than you are coming sideways on the boom, right? Because coming sideways, those radials, you're only hitting the little ends of them. But when you're running down the boom, you're hitting the full length each time you hit one. So it's really surface area. It's yeah. Like it's, it's, <sighs> yes. Surface area looking from a horizontal. Uh, you see is your shape factor. Uh, the calculation on that one is mind-boggling. Um, I, I didn't put a snippet, I should have, but the just for your round members, there are nine different calculations for a round member depending on your length to width ratio. So it gets very detailed. Uh, so lastly, your, uh, your final force is going to be your wind area, your, um, your G, I'm trying to remember what that one is. It's typically one, uh, <laughs> but I forget what that factor is. Uh, and then your wind area. Uh, your wind area is your area plus your shape factor. So if you really want to get into the weeds and bring that down, you can really bring that area down. But as far as getting an idea of, of how much load you should expect from an antenna, the simplified version is going to be the, an easy way to go. It's in the works. Uh, if, you were in, if you were in, let's say, a wooded area, but you had an open area large enough to put up a, a, just a uh, I'll say 50 to 60 foot tower. Okay. And but the, the trees in the outlying area were much taller than what your antenna is going to be. Uh, I guess what I'm looking at is uh, it, it would be significantly reduced. Reduced. Yes. Okay. Um, and, and that's one of the things with all those K factors. What it, it takes into account um, if you're protected by trees, protected by buildings, protected by whatever. Um, also, when we do a, a full analysis, we have to look at multiple directions too. And so we're looking at, okay, well, from this direction, we're protected from trees, but from this direction, we've got a field and we're wide open, right? And so that makes a very big difference if the wind's coming from the tree line versus if it's coming from the field. Um, and so, yeah, you want to 
take into consideration anytime you can have cover. Now, you don't want it to be right up on the tower, but anytime you can have some sort of cover, it will drastically reduce the, the wind load. Okay. But even still, going back to that antenna loading, even with everything else the same, if we're looking at 106 mile an hour, we're only looking at about, I think it was 190 pounds uh, on a five and a half square foot antenna. Uh, now, that is not the tower loading, Mm -hmm. but that's just the antenna loading so it's not as bad as it seems a lot of times a lot of a lot of people think oh well you know putting it up there it's, it's going to be a big wind sail it's going to catch and the winds are going to drag it away it, it's not getting the loading that much as much as it, it would seem uh, and primarily it's because the antennas we're typically running are round members and, and fairly slender members we're not running anything big um, when it comes to telecommunications, the antennas we're running in telecom are humongous. Uh, I, I've had one that's uh, four foot by four foot square. Um, and the wind loading on that is astronomical, astronomical. Um, so we're, I mean, we can easily in telecommunications just for one antenna get over 500 pounds of wind loading from one antenna. Uh, and most sites were running 12 antennas per site for, for one carrier. If you remember that picture from the beginning, there was multiple layers to that antenna. Yeah. Typically, each one of those layers is a separate carrier. Right? This so, would be more like for cell phone type tower. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, that's what I do is cell phone towers. Um, and so the, back when they first started putting up towers, each company came in and built their own tower but they, it was too expensive to upkeep, not worth it. So now, I think T-Mobile still has a couple of towers, but pretty much everybody else, they do not own the tower. The tower is owned by a third party. Uh, and then AT&T just pays space on a tower. Uh, they're like, hey, we want this elevation. And Sprint comes in and says, hey, we want this elevation. And T-Mobile comes in and they want this elevation. Um, and so you'll end up with multiple carriers on the same tower uh, and it, it very quickly gets into the thousands of pounds of wind loading. But when you work with wind loader, the calculation of wind load, do you also consider, especially you say the top two guys, the guy wire, the guy wire clamps? <clears throat> when we're doing a full telecommunications analysis, yes. We do consider the wire stuff. We don't consider the clamps, but we do consider the wire itself. Um, That's gotta be. Realistically, small. for ham purposes, yeah. it's gonna be insignificant. It's not gonna be worth the analysis. Um, understand, when we're talking telecommunications towers, we're talking 2% capacity could mean the difference between spending 50 grand to do a, a upgrade modification or not, right? And so if we can narrow down and, and squeak that extra 2% out of it by you know running the analysis on the guys and actually taking the, the actual loading on each guy wire, then it's worth it to them. Again, when it comes to, with a, a modification, just the modification portion, it, it can be 50,000 and up uh, for the cost of that. And then, they also have to have the design done, which is usually another thirty, forty thousand dollars, and so it, it adds up very quickly. Um, but for ham purposes, realistically, I wouldn't even include the the guy wires in it. Um, the load calculation is so conservative; it's got way more capacity than even if you were to load that tower up with guy wires. What you would get out of those wires. Any other questions? Thank you. Well, all right, so that's a big, huge Yeah, so one, one of the things uh, Dave had asked me to look into uh, was K factors and when you're dealing with rotators. And I looked into it, and my honest opinion is K factors 
are not a good way of really assessing the original needs and capacities for a rotator. I don't like the way they do it. Um, perhaps uh, when I get some spare time, I may look into coming up with a better way of doing it. Um, the issue they're running into is uh, when they look at an antenna, um, say you've got a 100 pound antenna, uh, they're considering all 100 pounds to be out at the farthest tip of that antenna when it comes to rotating. Realistically, it's going to be the center of mass, which is going to be pretty close to where you're mounting it probably. Um, uh, and typically, we're not running them like that, except for a few occasions. But um, so realistically, the K-factor, I, I don't like considering the entire weight of the antenna out of the furthest tip of the antenna. So, that, so, so that's, that's an overkill then? I mean, it, it, it is an overkill, ultra yes. Conservative. Yes, it is extremely conservative. Um, and not realistic. Um, wow, that, that's a cool statement. We had a that, long periodic no, that uh, one person who carried that thing up a 20 foot tower with all the 20 foot. Another guy was following him up there, but he hand carried that, that long periodic up there fully assembled. The other guy helped to fasten it on there. And uh, I don't think the total weight of it was uh, over about 150 pounds, something like that. So, so there was an antenna I was looking at. I don't remember which one. I, I looked at a number of different antennas uh, preparing for this, uh, and especially looking at the K factors. And one of them, I want to say it was 110 pounds, and they they figured the turning radius was something like 28 feet. And so their K factor was 28 times 110, which is around 300 let's say uh, to me I, I don't believe that it would take if you had a one foot arm at the base of that pole it, I don't think it would take 300 pounds to rotate that antenna that that does not seem accurate to me because that, that that's what that K factor is oh. the K factor is well, your average one, rotor up there is uh, not going to it's not going to be turning 300 pounds you're talking about you're probably now this is with all 300 the foot bearings pounds. in there that the actual rotation of that is going to be uh, you could probably run a very small motor and turn those and, and so we're, we're talking 300 foot pounds so the torque <laughs> Uh, so at, at one foot out, at one foot, if you had a one foot arm on it, right? They're saying it would take 300 pounds to get that spinning. I don't think we're going to be near that. foot pounds. That's what he's saying. That, but that's what that. That's how the K factor. I've worked on a lot of rotors and uh, rebuilt some of them, and, and the actual motor in them is very small. Hey, Carol, the torque is not that big. Yeah, I, I agree. I I think the number they're giving is extreme for what the antenna torque actually is. Um, and so it it may very well be just like. They extremely derate the towers. They're also extremely derating the rotors just because they don't want to have to run the numbers on them. It's just quicker and easier to say, okay, how much can this handle? You know, divided by five, that's what we're going to put out for the public. Okay, well, um, um, if, uh, go ahead, <laughs> <laughs> well, that, uh, You have to add also, it's not just the torque of creating the momentum so saying you have to stop yeah. it's the braking when i looked at the rotators uh they usually have a uh drive torque and a braking torque yeah. both um they'll, they'll actually rate it for both and so uh, i agree more with the braking torque because typically your your braking force is going to be a fairly instantaneous uh, force, right? You're gonna stop and you want it to stop right where you told it to stop. Um, but as far as the drive torque, which is what the K value is rated off of, it's the drive torque. Um, I don't think that that's accurate. I, I think it, it will make a, a difference on how quickly 
It can rotate that. If you have a wind up. force, say at 45 to 80 degrees and against the antenna, it's going to be your braking capability to hold it. Yes. Yes. So the, the braking force is both stopping the rotation and keeping it from rotating under wind. Yes. But also, when you're dealing with antennas, a lot of them are symmetrical or nearly symmetrical. And so realistically, your wind loading is going to be even on both sides of that pipe, of that mass pipe, depending on the antenna. Uh, but a lot of them are fairly balanced. <laughs> So you're not going to get an extreme loading on one side, depending on your antenna. Well, say your antenna, you want it pointing east, you want to bring it up to north, but you have a northwest wind that's going to fight you. Yes, depending on how it's mounted. And it's not, there's no balance from the other direction. It's all one direction. Uh, again, depending on where you're rotating it from, right? Because if you have it, the the tail end of your your antenna is is right. So if you're wanting to rotate it to the right and your tail is hanging out, then that wind is actually going to push you quicker. So it depends on where you're where you're rotating from. your antenna, you shouldn't. <laughs> yeah. You're just down. So yeah. down. The key, to that, the key to that is thrust bearings because now you're taking a lot of the weight off the bearings and the road. Well, right. And, and that was, that was, I want to get this question. Yeah. In, in my installation, I don't have that thrust bearing capability. Okay. So my rotator is going to take the full load, the lateral load of the antenna. So my question is, okay, I understand the torque, and now what about, I don't know, I don't know how I would describe it, but, but let's say the, 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 uh, the, the, the horizontal uh, uh, stress so on what, the tower. So what you're dealing with yes. uh, is basically a miniature tower mounted on top of a tower, yep. right? The mass pipe coming off of that rotator right. is a miniature tower, right, on top of the tower. So the same idea applies here. The longer you make that, the easier it is to buckle. Well, it's going to be, so, it's going to be the, the um, rotator is going to be here, the antenna is going to be here. Okay. So it, it's going to be right. That, that's how it, it depends on well, you're you're running through through the rotator. No, no. You're you have the rotator and the antenna. There's nothing supporting it. Oh. Remember, it's, it's, it's a mass. rotation. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a good deal. Deal. Put the rotator down here. Two foot. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Here. Where's that thrust bearing going to mount? Do the mass. It can't mount. There's nothing there. Uh, yes. After the tower Let's comes see, up, that's uh, it. There's nothing above that. Here's the tower. It goes up to here. Yeah. You the front and I may have That one's 18. You put a thrust bearing. I think that one's brand. Okay, and then what, what, what supports the That was going to be t bubble because it's crap. <laughs> the mask is the rotator. t bubble is the more now to take care of their, their mounting system. So, so um, here's the top. Yeah. We see some rough ones. Um, there was a period of time where they did run structural analysis so now they're trying to upgrade all the mountains and do all the structurals and they were failing a lot they they were designed for back when it was cell phones were two little antennas uh, and now with the amount of data that's being transmitted the antennas got short now they didn't do a good job keeping them up <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.